Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to this class. In this class, we are going to learn about one of the important infections of gastrointestinal tract. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to learn about gastrointestinal infection in detail, the probable causative agents and its lab diagnosis. To meet our objectives of this class, contents will be discussed under these headings, the details of disease including its epidemiology. We are going to learn about the probable causative agents under these headings and the laboratory diagnosis of this particular infection. What we are going to do in this class is taking two real life examples of the cases we came across and discussing them as the case workup, including its laboratory diagnosis. This is the best way to learn and we are going to start this class with the discussion. This was a case, Geeta 11 year old student who came to us with the complaints of bloody diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. She had these complaints since more than 10 days. She only approached the doctor when the symptoms aggravated. Parents were interviewed for little more history. They told us that disease was gradually in onset. She was fine before about 15 days back, she started having watery diarrhea which gradually turned to bloody diarrhea. Frequency of diarrhea was about 4 to 6 times a day and she also had right sided abdominal pain, however it was diffuse in nature. She did not have any fever or severe pain while passing motions or urge to pass the motions which is called as the tenismus. On examination, doctor found that vitals were normal, she was having mild dehydration and on examination of the abdomen, there was tenderness especially in the right side of the abdomen and no mass or no guarding. What do you think she is suffering from? Of course, with the history of bloody diarrhea, we call this condition as the dysentery. But one important thing here is that we need to differentiate whether the dysentery is of bacterial in origin or parasitic in origin. So, we know that there are different bacteria or parasites which can cause such infections. First of all, let us know what is the definition of dysentery. Dysentery is an infective disease of large bowels which is characterized by frequent passing of blood and mucus with stool along with severe abdominal cramps. As I said, various bacteria or parasites are responsible for causing dysentery. These are few bacteria, especially the Shigella species, Ischgrisia coli, Shigella toxin producing E. coli that is STEC, enterohemorrhagic E. coli and enterohinvasive E. coli which also produce a similar toxin as Shigella. Campylobacter jejuni, Salmonella, Vibrio are some of the others. The, coming to the parasites which can cause such condition, the important one amongst them is Entamoeba, Histolytica, Giardia, Lamblia and others. Especially in case of Gita, we suspect this condition to be parasitic in origin. That is why we would like to call it as the amoebic dysentery. Why we suspect amoebic dysentery in this case? is because onset was gradual, bloody diarrhea, copious in amount and offensive stools, no fever, no toxicity or no tenesmus was there. These are some of the symptoms which will help us to differentiate it from the bacterial diarrhea and there was localized abdominal pain. All these 
clinical as well as some of the laboratory gross examination findings we will, which will help us to call it as the amoebic dysentery. Although we could now suspect amoebic dysentery, however, etiological diagnosis is very very important and essential for proper patient management and also for its prevention and control. So, what was done in case of Gita was the stool was collected and it was immediately transferred to the laboratory. Coming to the lab diagnosis, we have various modalities for laboratory diagnosis including first and the foremost as I was telling you that the points which made us suspect amoebic dysentery is the gross examination of the stool specimen itself. We have microscopy which is the gold standard, serological tests are available wherein we could either detect antigen or antibody and we could also go for culture of the organisms. On gross examination of the specimen, the color was brick red offensive in odor, it was also mixed with mucus flakes and it was non adherent to the container. All these points also would differentiate it from the bacterial dysentery in which condition the points which are mentioned here are uh, slightly different in case of bacterial dysentery. Having these points taken into consideration, we moved on to the microscopy. We did normal saline preparation in which we could see the trophozoites, however, they were not motile. Then we stained the stool preparation wherein we could see the trophozoites. The trophozoites are about 20 to 30 micrometer in size, they had nucleus and the important features which were noted are the ingested RBCs. These are characteristic of trophozoites of amoebae. Then iodine preparation of the stool was done, however, on without concentrating the stool specimen, we initially did not appreciate much, but after subjecting the stool to formalin ether concentration technique, we could see the cysts of the same parasite. The cyst are having refractile cyst wall and we could also see some glycogen mass inside. So, these were the findings of microscopy. We could also see some charcoal laden crystals. These are clear diamond shape which are seen mostly in case of amoebiasis. In the wet mount examination, there were not much of pus cells which is actually in contrast to what we see in case of bacillary dysentery and we see the clumped RBCs which will be in the form of role formation in case of bacillary dysentery. These are some of the important findings which actually supported our uh, clinical diagnosis of amoebic dysentery. Moving ahead with this, we name the probable parasite as the Entamoeba histolytica. We also went for some quick serological tests like ELISA and latex agglutination test to look for the lectin antigen which is uh, the part of troposoal cell wall of Entamoeba histolytica. However, we could get this test as uh, strongly positive which also helped us consolidate on our diagnosis of the amoebic dysentery in case of Gita. So, what we did was we immediately communicated to the treating physician and accordingly she was put up on metronidazole therapy and as she was dehydrated fluid replacement was given and Gita got well within 4 days. This was the story of Gita who suffered from amoebic dysentery. As I said, best way to learn about any disease is to discuss the real time cases. Here is a second case, Babu, 21 year old social worker, he used to work for an NGO. His job was to go for field visits and collect the data. He started having symptoms of chronic bloody diarrhea, anorexia, weight loss. This was going on for quite some time, however, he neglected the symptoms and he approached the doctor only when his symptoms aggravated and he started also developing fever, hypochondriac pain, etc. On probing, Babu gave us the history that whenever he visited the fields, he used to consume the tap water in that particular village. The diarrhea was actually to begin with was watery and it turned to be bloody later. Frequency of stools was 6 to 8 times per day, amount of stool was copious and it was offensive odor and he also had abdominal pain. 
on examination we found that the temperature was slightly raised and abdominal ab examination revealed there was mass there was tenderness and guarding as well and there was also enlarged liver the basic hematological investigations were done and there was leukocytosis and we noticed that there was no eosinophilia although we were suspecting some kind of a parasitic infection in this this is one of the feature what we have to note there was increased alkaline phosphatase levels which added to our supportive findings a diagnostic aspiration was done as we noticed a space occupying lesion in the liver it was suggested that the aspiration was to be done from the side walls of the lesion so that we could recover the parasites otherwise we would miss the parasites once the pus was collected that was sent to the laboratory as i said that even though we have made a clinical diagnosis of liver abscess in this case confirming the etiology and the pathogen is very very important because we need to target the specific therapy here for its control and prevention going in these lines the pus was collected also the stool specimen was collected from babu that was sent to the laboratory we have various modalities for lab diagnosis as discussed going for the gross examination of the specimen which will give us a lot of clues about the diagnosis the pus was very typical here that is ankovy sauce pus this pus is almost chocolate brown in color thick and mucoid the stool specimen was brick red in color having some mucus flakes in that it was copious and offensive in odor we next went for the microscopy from the pus sample we could see the trophozoites as we insisted that the pus was to be collected from the side uh, walls of the abscess not really from the center as we could get only the necrotic material and nothing much from the center of the abscess however luckily we could find the trophozoites here the trophozoit was about 20 to 30 micrometer in size having the nucleus and ingested rbcs inside similarly the stool examination was also done stool examination did not reveal any trophozoites and it revealed the cyst after formalin ether concentration technique here there was a scanty cellular exudate that means there were not much of fast cells which suggested it was not an active kind of disease one important thing we need to note down here is that we can never expect cysts from the pus this is one point to be noted so in this case in microscopy we noted down the presence of trophozoites in pus sample and cysts from the stool sample this gave us diagnosis suggestive of entamoeba histolytica so what do you think he is suffering from it is not an active intestinal disease but we noticed some pathology in the liver which has led to the causation of abscess i think this goes in favor of amoebic liver abscess this diagnosis was also supported by clinical findings babu had chronic bloody diarrhea he was frequently visiting the endemic area and was consuming contaminated water from uh, different sources there and he was also having abdominal pain got aggravated starting with fever and other uh, constitutional symptoms so in case of babu we made the diagnosis of amoebic liver abscess further some more tests were done antigen detection was done from the pus as well as from stool samples it was positive the test which we used for confirming the antibody rise are the elisa we could also go for latex agglutination test especially as a rapid test when we are diagnosing intestinal amoebiasis or extra intestinal amoebiasis for antigen detection these were some of the serological tests which will definitely help us to support the diagnosis and confirm the diagnosis we also have some culture methods to go for usually they are done for academic purpose there are many media which are available one of them can be used this is the popular medium what we can go for there are some other tests like molecular test liver histopathological studies are very important the liver histology also will show typical hepatic changes in the liver as well as the abscess we can also go for mri and 
CT scan, ultrasonography to locate the lesion. So, ultimately the results were communicated to the doctor and he started him on metronidazole 750 mg TID and along with that paramomycin combined treatment was given in case of Babu and he returned home after one week. So, these are the two stories. In this part of the lesson, we have covered some points about the disease itself and some aspects of the treatment and in detail the laboratory diagnosis how we worked up with these two cases. We are left with to study little more details about amoebiasis itself and etiological agent in detail. Let us do that now. Amoebiasis is caused by Entamoeba histolytica that is a protozoan parasite. It is anaerobic in nature and predominantly it infects the humans and those also are the asymptomatic carrier. Worldwide about 50 million people are supposed to be infested and about 1 lakh of them suffer annually, 50,000 of them die. This says that it is a common disease and we need to do the diagnosis in the right time and treat the disease specifically as well as to prevent the disease. There are different clinical forms of this disease as we have seen in our two cases. First one is asymptomatic luminal amoebiasis. This is the most commonest one we come across and also recently it has been found out that it may not be actually entamoeba histolytica. It could be one of the milder forms of parasites. This particular asymptomatic luminal amoebiasis is also called as the growling abdomen or the growling tummy because it is commonly present and it just presents as some discomfort in the abdomen. The other form is the invasive amoebic dysentery as we saw in case of Gita. The third one was the extra intestinal amoebiasis this we discussed in case of Mr. Babu. This occurs in about 2 to 10 percent of the population. Extra intestinal amoebiasis can occur in different organs like liver, lungs, kidney and brain and cutaneous amoebiasis. There are some more things we need to know about the disease. The source as I said are the humans. The transmission can occur direct uh, transmission from man to man especially it is common in male homosexuals and uh, high risk sexual behavior. Indirect transmission can be through food, water or through fomites. Mode of infection is by ingesting the cyst, mature cyst or the quadrinucleate cyst. Once man ingests the disease starts from there. The infective form as I said is a quadrinucleate cyst. Pathogenic form is the trophozoite. Trophozoite is a active and motile form of this parasite. It just exists in two forms that is cyst and the trophozoite form. Cyst form is inactive and the dormant form and that is usually it is exhibited by this parasite for its continu continuation of the species and not for initiating pathogenesis itself. Incubation period is uh, 1 to 4 months for extra intestinal and 1 to 4 weeks for the intestinal amoebiasis. The risk factors are overcrowding, poor sanitary conditions and high risk sex behavior, malnutrition, pregnancy and others. Well friends, now let us learn life cycle of Entamoeba histolytica. It is a simple life cycle, basically encystation and existation takes place. The infective forms are the quadrinucleate cyst. Man consumes these forms through contaminated food or drink. When man ingests them, they go and locate into the large intestine, especially the ileocecal junction. It is at this place that the existation starts. The cyst wall will start weakening up as you can see here and the amoeboid movements will start developing inside the cyst wall and a trophozoite comes out of it. The trophozoite will further divide into amoebulae. Amoebulae are the young and the active forms of this parasite. They attack the intestinal as well as the extra intestinal sites. As you can see here, this is a trophozoid form which is developing lesions not only in the intestine, but it can gain access through the circulation into any surrounding parts or the distant parts and can cause abscesses all over. After some time, the trophozoite will start developing into a cyst form. This particular part of the cycle is called as the encystation. You can see here 
the single nucleus has divided and it matures into a quadrinucleate cyst and now this form is ready to attack the next person. Let us uh, now study about morphological forms. As I said it exists in two forms the trophozoite and the cyst form. The trophozoite form is the active amoeboid form and it is a motile form. Unlike our bacteria it is motile with the help of throwing pseudopodia. Some of the fresh stool samples we could appreciate this slow motility shown by the trophozoite. It has got ectoplasm, endoplasm and the nucleus. Nucleus has got typical cartwheel appearance and we are also seeing some of ingested RBCs here. This uh, parasite particularly it can feed on existing bacteria in the intestinal lumen and also it can feed on some of our uh, RBCs. On the other hand we have the cyst form which is highly thick and refractile form. The size is almost a half of the trophozoite it is 10 to 20 micrometer it has got 4 nuclei. So, this is the cyst. What is important here is that we need to differentiate entamoeba histolytica from other non pathogenic entamoebae that like entamoeba dispar, uh, entamoeba coli and others. How can we differentiate this of course, by doing genetic uh, studies by estimating the whether a parasite has got ingested RBCs or not is another factor which will help us to differentiate from entamoeba histolytica with all these other non pathogenic ones. Entamoeba histolytica will have the ingested RBCs as compared to non pathogenic form. This is one of the important features which we can remember to differentiate between the two. How does this cause pathogenesis? It has got some very important virulence factors which will help this parasite to cause extreme invasive type of disease that is amoebic dysentery and extra intestinal amoebiasis is mainly produced because it has got the trophozoite has got a um, uh, ability to move that is motility plus it has got the adhesins. This is the adhesin which is lectin which is an important factor once the parasite adheres to the intestinal epithelial mucosa the lectin will help in adhesion as well as it will help the parasite to penetrate deep into the columnar epithelial cells of the intestine. After that it will also help stimulates the secretion of interleukin 8 and when the interleukin 8 is uh, produced it will involve a series of inflammatory reactions and the whole inflammatory process will set up that is how a small abscess is going to be uh, resulted as a initial part of pathogenesis of amoebiasis. These small abscesses they are going to have the pout like edges and they will slowly break down and then they will uh, form the shallow ulcers. Other virulence factors are lytic peptides they are also called as amoeba pores which will cause the channels in the cells. Ultimately these micro channels will help the cell to lyse very rapidly that is how it is going to contribute to the pathogenesis. Other than that we have cysteine proteases and phospholipases. What they do is they degrade the protein and also they degrade the extracellular matrix. Unlike in case of toxin mediated dysentery here only the ulcer area is affected it is deeply involved until they hit the muscularis area muscularis mucosa they are going to spread sideways. Whereas, if it is a toxin mediated uh, dysentery then we see the lot of local area will be inflamed that is in between the ulcers also the, there is no healthy mucosa what we can find in case of bacillary dysentery whereas, here the area intervening between the two ulcers is supposed to be healthy. However, sometimes these small ulcers can collise with each other and they can form the large ulcers. This is what happens uh, as a result of action of all these virulence factors there is invasion and there is erosion necrosis and they perforate. Actually the organisms usually they do not cross the muscularis layers they go sideways sometimes some of them will succeed in crossing this and they can also perforate peritoneum they can enter into the different organs also into the thorax as I have discussed. All this pathogenesis will ultimately lead in production of 
shallow flask shaped ulcers. The flask shaped ulcer will have a narrow neck or the mouth with a broad base and undermining edges. This is what is called as the undermining edge. This is the pathology and pathogenesis of amoebiasis. As a result of strong virulence factors and its capacity to invade into deeper tissues, we can expect lot of complications. It could be restricted to intestine that is called as amoebic colitis. So, sometimes that may result into toxic megacolon if it is highly invasive type of disease. There could be amoeboma, there could be masses or abscesses. Then especially the sigmoidorectal area involved, then it could also go in for perineal ulceration. As a result of extra intestinal amoebiasis, there could be amoebic hepatitis or there could be amoebic liver abscess, amoebic appendicitis or amoebic peritonitis, cerebral amoebiasis, pulmonary amoebiasis and the splenic abscess. These are all some of the very important complications coming to the treatment and prevention of this disease. The drug of choice here as we treated our two cases with metronidazole, this is the drug of choice. Usually the dose is 750 mg given for 10 or more days. Actually metronidazole is both luminal as well as the tissue amoebicidal uh, agent, a very effective one. We can also club it with paramomycin. This is just to ensure that complete eradication of the parasite takes place. In our uh, second case, we treated him with both these drugs metronidazole and paramomycin. Idoquinolone can be given and azithromycin could also be used. Prevention as this is a one of the important fecal oral uh, disease, we could improve the sanitation to prevent the disease occurring, especially the infective forms are present and they are shed from the carriers continually in the community and they remain as the reservoirs of spreading the infection. Proper sewage disposal and the purification water, all these factors will definitely go a long way when we want to control and prevent uh, this particular disease. It is a very common disease. We need to take care of hygienic measures to control this infection. Now I have completed discussing all the points which we set out uh, in the beginning of this class. Let us look at this disease at glance. Amoebiasis is a common disease and it is also known to cause complications. It is caused by Entamoeba histolytica, it exists as trophozoite and cyst forms. Microscopic examination of stool forms mainstay of diagnosis. Stool examination along with serology will definitely help in confirming the disease, especially if it is an invasive disease, antibody and antigen detection becomes important. Metronidazole is the drug of choice, prevention is by improving the sanitary measures. With this, we have covered all the contents of this class and also achieved our lesson objectives. We have learnt about the disease amoebiasis, we have also learnt about entamoeba histolytica and how do we diagnose such cases in the laboratory. Thank you.